All right, it is 6.35. Shall we start? All right, everyone, thank you so much for coming. I appreciate you all being here. Tonight we are here to listen to Catherine Colborn speak about her practice. And I'm just gonna introduce Catherine real quick and then we'll just dive into it. So Catherine Colborn is an artist living and working in Cincinnati, Ohio. She received her BA in studio art and English from Xavier University and her MFA in studio art with a focus in drawing and painting at the University of North Carolina, Greensboro. Her work engages with themes of sanctuary and threshold, exploring the place of painting in a culture saturated with an abundance of imagery. In recent years, she has traveled to Berlin and Mexico City and has made multiple trips to Ireland, all for personal research and study. In 2015, she completed an artist residency at the Burren College of Art in County Clare. She has exhibited her work around the United States. Recent exhibitions include a solo show at Greensboro Project Space in North Carolina, as well as group shows with the Bolivar Gallery the, at the University of Kentucky and the Weatherspoon Art Museum, and a nationally juried exhibition at Site Brooklyn in New York City, Manifest Gallery in Ohio, and Durham Art Guild in North Carolina. Past exhibitions include a solo show at Xavier University Art Gallery and nationally juried exhibitions at Wichita Center, for the Arts in Kansas and the Shirt Factory in New York. She currently teaches drawing, painting, and foundations at Northern Kentucky University and has plans to complete an upcoming residency at Vermont Studio Center. Without further ado, I give you Catherine Colborn. Yay! This is all appreciated. Um, as, as Isabel just mentioned, my name is Catherine Colborn. Thank you all so much for joining in, for listening. Um, it's nice to kind of virtually be with you. Um, so I wanted to kind of preface this talk by um, just kind of talking about when this work was made. So all of the work in this exhibition um, was created between the years 2019 and 2021. Um, and as, as we all know, <laughs> the amount of change that we've really experienced as global citizens in this time has been um, immense. And so it's it's really interesting to think, you know, just to recognize that some of this work was created pre-pandemic, some of it was created mid-pandemic, um, and naturally there's there's a difference in the way that I remember their construction or think about kind of how they came to be. But regarding it, like it's become more, <clears throat> like it has become more and more. Um, I guess appropriate. Um, there just are deeply significant threads that have existed in sort of the making of all of this work that I really plan to focus on tonight. So um, I thought maybe I'd start by talking about the um, the title of this exhibition, which is Unfixing. Um, and I want to clarify that when I'm referring to unfixing or or using this term, it's not a term that refers to fixing as problem solving, but fixing um, as the notion of that which is sort of attached, that which is bound. Um, so the notion of anything that is unfixed is, is boundless or unattached. Um, and the act of unfixing is in my mind associated with the act of unclenching. Um, and that's something I've just been struggling with so much. I, I, I think I always have, but especially in the last couple of years, um, unclenching mentally, physically, emotionally, spiritually, um, I am somebody who is maybe problematically compelled by drive and production and growth. Um, and I, a lot of times you can ask uh, my partner, my husband, I'm, I'm often overrun by that compulsion. Um, and so one of the reasons I make work at all is to kind of teach myself a new reality um, and to, in, or to, you know, invent one, to create the space, to build a new one. Um, and I, it's interesting to think about this in relation to, um, my sense of spirituality or my awareness of spirituality. Um, I've for, I think my entire life have been very interested and, and had the desire to grapple with intangible things. Um, I was raised Catholic and I went to Catholic school for 12 plus years. Um, uh, theology, which is just the study of the concept of God and the study of what is sacred um, has, was really embedded in my adolescence. Um, and even in my time in undergraduate school, I went to a Catholic college. And so it's, it's really kind of hammered in, um, you know, to my brain. 
Um, so, and when I was young, I was really immersed in ritual. I was immersed in what I would refer to as Catholic culture, just based on where I grew up. Um, but as I got older, my fascination really turned to philosophy and more academic theological debate. It just gave me a sort of new language to ask these really big questions. And the more I learned and, and studied, the, the less sure or um, kind of grounded I felt in anything. And, and that was very healthy because it led me to ask very big questions. It led me to, to consider um, more complex concepts. Um, at some point, when I was an undergrad, probably late, late in my undergraduate career, um, and uh, maybe afterwards, I think after I graduated undergrad, I started to become really interested in mysticism, um, especially Jewish mysticism. Um, and in, in my research, I stumbled across this beautiful story, which was told by um, Krista Tippett, told by um, a, to Krista Tippett by a woman named Rachel Naomi Remen. Um, and Krista Tippett is uh, the host of a very famous podcast called On Being, which I'd, I'd recommend to anyone. Um, and Rachel Naomi Remen recounts this story that her rabbi grandfather told her. And it begins with nothing. It is an origin story. Um, it begins with the holy darkness of the universe. Um, and from that darkness emerged this great, great light. And then for some reason there is an accident and the vessels that contain this light, this um, wholeness of the world broke. And the wholeness, this light of the cosmos was scattered into a million fragments of light and they fell into all events and all people across time where they remain deeply hidden until this very day. And now according to Remen's grandfather, this, um, the human race is a response to this accident so that we are tasked with restoring the world. We are tasked with restoring the cosmos. Um, and in, in Hebrew, this task is referred to as Takan Alam. Um, and it's the idea that we're here because we're born with the capacity to find all the hidden light and in the events and all people throughout all of time and to make it visible again and thereby to restore this innate wholeness of the world. Um, and it's just this really beautiful, beautiful story. It's so lovely. It's such a wonderful sort of myth and um, you know, way of kind of seeing our, our very you know, uncertain purpose um, as human beings. Um, but it's also, I mean, understandably maybe appears kind of naive or, or silly. And I, 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 hope, I hope that you can kind of see the earnestness and the beauty in this story. But I know that we're living in a sort of deeply fractured and broken political system and, and social structure and ecosystem. Um, and so it's almost laughably optimistic to, to be this earnest in um, believing this story. Um, you know, I just, we're watching refugees scour the earth for safety and homeland and we're watching ecological disasters ravage our homes and natural, you know, burning away natural habitats. And, and it, is, it is so hard to kind of buy into this ideal. Um, but I, if, I'm, if I'm honest, it's the thing that motivates me to make work, this idea. Um, it sounds almost, you know, it, grandiose um, and it's almost embarrassing. It's like absurd to say it out loud, um, but, you know, to think that my work actually has any hand in repairing the cosmos. <laughs> um, the broken fragments of the world. But I, I do, I would say that my, I see my work as a way to navigate through that space, to navigate through the broken components of our universe, um, you know, maybe to keep it somewhat realistic. Um, and when I think about that motivation and I think about what I attempt to do when I'm going into the studio or how I'm working out my um, greatest struggles, I am brought to this great inspiration, Vermeer. I, I keep thinking I'm going to outgrow Vermeer and I never do. Um, I, I just keep coming back to him. And, and it's, I've been thinking about Vermeer, especially the last couple of years, um, because for those of you who may not know, um, Vermeer was Dutch um, and Holland, uh, which is Vermeer's home country, suffered terrible devastation in the 1650s which is of course the time in which Vermeer was painting. <laughs> um, it was also at the time when 
Europe was experiencing a, a ton of war and religious conflict and actually plague. Uh, plague was happening at this time. So that again, feels incredibly appropriate to be thinking about nowadays. Um, Lawrence Weschler, um, who's a great writer, um, he's, he's written about Vermeer's work and he writes this, he writes, at a tremendously turbulent juncture in the history of his continent, Vermeer had been finding and inventing a zone filled with peace, a small room, an intimate vision, and then breathing it all out. Uh, and by breathing it all out, um, Weschler is referring to this protected inner peace that's not affected by external storming, but it's rather something that's softly expressed outward from the inside. Um, and maybe perhaps in hope of extending some of that calm or stillness um, into a country that was wrestling with chaos and rapid change. Um, it's, it's, you know, an appropriate reference, an appropriate sort of conversation to be having. I am always thinking about Vermeer, um, or at least these days I am. Um, yeah. So I, my work personally contends with a lot of these like, similar ideas. I am interested in sanctuary, um, also sort of projecting a protected space, um, quietness, sacredness, um, and in a lot of ways are sort of the curious notion that is home. Um, I think a lot about how, how we, um, you know, build and consider home, the, the idea of home, um, especially today. Um, and how we understand it. But, you know, there's also some anxiety of longing. Um, there's a fascination with strangeness and the mystery of thresholds, those places where we transition. Um, you know, and a lot of my studio practice comes out of, it's born out of this desire that I have to fix the un unfixable. And that's, again, not referring to solving problems necessarily, but to trying to pin down the things that are hard to speak about, the things that are hard to actually cognize consciously. <laughs> um, these like really elusive, um, kind of seemingly impossible paradoxes that, um, you know, again, shouldn't ever really fit together. They can't exist together, but somehow um, have to. Uh, how, do I, how do I handle these things that I can't fully register in my mind? Um, I'm really kind of chasing this weird in-betweenness that encompasses enough enough space and um, time and, and whatever it is, something that can hold both a simultaneous coming and going, a simultaneous unity and separation, right? There must be some sort of circular place where all of this can exist as, um, as one thing, even though, of course, consciously we know it, it can't. Um, so those are those are big ideas. Those are, are hard ideas to express. But I'm you know I'm also propelled by my own exhaustion. Um, you know when I think about you know Vermeer's efforts to contend with a um, ravaged countryside that he's living in, I think about my own desire for reprieve um, from my own sort of compulsory drive for production for action. Um, and then that sense of relief that when I do find it is usually that the exact space that's needed to allow for the recognition of these unknowable things that I, I really want to engage with. Um, and, you know, in order to kind of create the space for that, um, we, I think we require a protected space in order to invite in the impossible. Um, there's a really wonderful book um, entitled Slow Art which was written by Arden Reed, I think in 2018. Um, and it explores this aesthetic field that Arden Reed calls slow art. Um, and he describes it not necessarily as a set of aesthetic objects, but rather an encounter between object and observer. Um, that slow art is what transpires between um, beholders and the beheld, that it exists in both the space and time rather than the objects themselves. So Reed proposes, um, that slow art uh, is significantly relative to space. And particularly as he argues, slow art offers a path to reclaim social spaces that have been stripped or devoid of contemplative practices that are no longer really available to us as they, they used to be in a time um, you know, when society was uh, communally more religious. Um, and now that we're living in a more secular you know, um, culture, that we don't have
have access to these things the way we the way we once did. Um, and he writes this. I, I love this quote. He writes, "The trauma of speed culture intensifies our need for downtime. The kind of retreats that religion used to offer, at the same time, op opportunities." For this have diminished. The option of worship, like con contemplating icons, shrinks in secular societies. We are left speeding along the autobahn of modernity, searching for rest stops and finding them shuttered. Perhaps experiencing art at a different pace um, can reclaim social spaces evacuated, uh, left by religious gazing. It is, you know, is it possible that slow art could be a modern secular displacement of old sacred, sacred practices? Um, there are just really great questions to contend with. Um, he's such a great writer and, and speaks so eloquently about, about these ideas. Um, my paintings personally are made very slowly. They're made gently. And that again, that could be out of my own desire and, and want to slow down. But the actual construction of my works are, um, you know, is pretty ritualistic um, by nature that wasn't necessarily intentional, but I found that it felt appropriate when I was making making these panels, that it's a ritual of kind of creating them. Um, they're cut down from really thick plywood on panel, and then they're hand sanded and sometimes shaped. You'll notice that some of these are, are sort of shaped so that they bevel out. Um, and they're primed with several layers of traditional gesso, which is then sanded down even more so that the surface is really, really smooth. It's like silk or marble. Um, and it's lovely to paint on, but it's, it's also reminiscent of, of uh, more ancient work. So I usually apply paint so thinly that it's essentially rubbed into the surface. A lot of times you can actually see the gesso brush marks because the paint is um, essentially rubbed in. Um, and the slow application has kind of become a way that I've explored notions of opacity and transparency. Um, and that is, you know, seeing and not seeing. Um, and as a result, the paintings kind of begin to embody this very gentle confusion or uncertainty. Um, and they're able to maintain a seductive ambiguity because of this. I think there's an almostness or an incompleteness um, that offers a viewer a measured space for pondering. It offers this protected measured space um, just for thinking, for resting. And again, because I, I grew up sort of steeped in the Catholic imagination, um, the reference or apparent relationship, I think with, with iconography in my paintings is not incidental. Um, there's a very soft and quiet nature of this work that you know I think creates, it's created not only by the sort of wispy appearance of the paint, but also because of that really smooth surface. Um, when you see these paintings in person, um, again, they are, they are so smooth, it's almost hard to imagine that they were um, put on the surface at all. Um, if you don't know much about icon painting, icon paintings um, are made you know, more, more commonly in the Eastern Orthodox Church. Um, as a, and they, they're meant to act as sort of transparent receptacles for divine content. Um, a lot of the traditional gesso and panel used in, in my series of work can, can be seen as a descendant of these surfaces um, that are used in icons and traditional altar pieces. Um, with the painted imagery, that's, it's meant to appear both layered and emergent from the surface. Um, there's a, a really wonderful way of thinking about iconography is that um, it's a term that's often um, associated with iconography is akapoeta, which is a Greek term that means made without hands, made without human hands. Um, there are common um, icons or it's, it's a reference to something like the veil of Veronica. If you know the, um, the Christian story, Jesus's face is, is pressed into the veil of Veronica and his, his image is left in it, um, or the tilma that um, leaves the image of Our Lady of Guadalupe, that these images were um, sort of uh, divinely um, emergent from the surface rather than ever applied by human hands themselves as, as far as the, the legends go. Um, so it's, it's, a, it's a wonderful kind of connection and thread to make. Um, when I'm working with imagery, a lot, of, a lot of my choices are meant to reference cradles, metaphorical cradles, um, basins and thresholds, right? Like these throughways, these um, spaces to look through or walk through, enter into and come out of. Um, they're all, I mean, metaphorically kind of referencing a space to hold a viewer um, and, or, you know, maybe hold me as I'm making these paintings. They're just spaces where I feel I can 
rest or be held for a moment. Um, I really, I, I've, I've written this, I said this, but I, I still really believe that the greatest thing about painting that because of its stillness, because of its imaginative capabilities with space and surface, um, it allows you to, and it teaches you how to rest where you don't live. Um, it allows and kind of teaches our minds to take moments to pause and also remember kind of physically where we are and how we move around those, those spaces and objects, those simultaneous, sim simultaneous spaces and objects, these paintings. Um, and I think painting domestic space only emphasizes this paradox. Um, so there's a, this, this painting, So Short a Distance, is a great example of, of that idea. Um, the title is actually taken from uh, a Jewish mystic theologian and poet, um, uh, Abram Joshua Heschel. Um, so in this painting, there's a, obviously a rocking chair that appears sort of half solid and half vapor um, and this foggy white on a soft pink ground. Um, I, I literally built a metaphorical cradle. Um, and it's small, it's very intimate. A lot of my works are, are meant to be intimate. They're really only 12 by nine inches. Um, it really unassumingly kind of welcomes this very soft breath. I think this pause that calls to mind the methodical movements of a rocker, right? Breathing in and out and the rocking back and forth of this, of this rocking chair. Um, that even in its stillness, that there's still a gentle suggestion of a back and forth until the chair kind of dissolves altogether as you move you know, your eyes down and, and it's some sort of misty way that it sort of first emerged or appeared. Um, and then there's this, I have this strange sort of rectangular form, which maybe appears to cast light. So it could be a window, but it's painted in the same way that this sort of blanket or, or veil is on the back of the chair. So maybe it's a form, um, but I think it's good to wrestle between window and form, right? That um, through way and an object, um, which is again, another metaphor for painting. Um, and this painting, maybe compared to a lot of my other ones, um, is maybe one of the most unfinished. Um, it sort of suggests, it suggests this incompleteness um, that I think has the potential to provoke a sort of tense uneasiness. I don't think it's actually tense, but it has that, it has that possibility. Um, it, there's a softness in the painting. There's a sort of grandmotherly tenderness in it. Um, there's this, you know, it's a, it's a wispy rocking chair that's, you know, existing in this vague pink nowhere. Um, and, and it feels cozy, but it's not restricted. Um, and it's a place that suggests a comfortable seat, but um, it also has no floors and no doors and no walls. Um, so it's a resting place, but it's not a place of permanence. There's uh, an installation um, sort of series of paintings that I completed in 2019. I, it's called Ch Sabbath Travel. And it was intended to provide a similar experience, um, but one that's more physically immersive for a viewer. So instead of a rocking chair to kind of cradle the mind, the sort of the small benches that um, are physically meant to hold the weight of a viewer's body. Um, and the paintings are actually at eye level. So when you sit at these benches, you're facing, um, you know, perpendicular to the wall <clears throat> or parallel, I guess you're, you're, you're turned to, to be sort of in the direction that's parallel with the wall. Um, and you're seeing the paintings from the side um, and they're flush to the wall um, and they're shaped. So they bevel outward and they're, they're placed and, and shaped to kind of recall airplane windows. Um, so the lineup of stools, I think obviously kind of elicits the routine of sitting on a bus or sitting on a train um, and the design and the material, which is um, in this case, like these sort of red oak ply benches, I think is reminiscent of church pews or, or temple pews. Um, and there's a reference. There's, I think, a reference in the way that these are made that, that's implied by the sort of deep blue um, hues and the sort of crystalline white glow in them. Um, it's meant to be a place of both community and singularity. Um, it's meant to remind us of these places of public transport and of communal worship, because I think these are the places that we so often regularly, on a regular basis, or at least used to, um, we used to sit side by side um, or front and behind each other. We would literally align ourselves um, many times without speaking to each other um, with the same goal to go somewhere, to participate in something. Um, and yet we're still sort of alone with our thoughts. Um, and in travel, especially, I think how we're propelled through space while sitting completely motionless, um, sitting still. 
it's just, you know, a space that's meant to offer offer a, a place to consider what this means to become more comfortable with the feeling of in-betweenness of both and um it's just a i i hope that it kind of offers that that for viewers that it becomes a place to think about painting a little differently um, i mentioned altar pieces earlier um when i think about places of worship i think about traditional painting grounds and structures um Maybe some of those pieces are most obvious in this piece. Um, this is hiding place. Um, and it's I just recently started a series of works that fold in on themselves that actually are constructed. And it's maybe hard to tell with these two images, but the the panel is shaped so that it literally fits in like a puzzle piece, like the beveled shape of each of these doors kind of rounds out and the, the middle space kind of bows um, like outward so that um, or inward I guess so that when you fold them all together they fit like a perfect puzzle um I've just it's mostly been born out of my own fascination with the unseen things um and our our fascination with not being able to fully um to to be like to we're not comfortable um with our awareness that we can't see the whole thing um so in this image obviously we see this upended table that's what's suggested to us. It's clear to us, um, but it's not whole, right? We see it in fragments. We see it on the two ends, the sort of two doors of this painting. Um, and, and you know, maybe the only way we can even think about it as a total image is because there's this shadowy silhouette that suggests the total, um, like some sort of impression or relief of the, the item itself in the center. Um, but we know that the only way that this whole this whole image can be put together can exist as its whole self is when the doors are closed and the painting is um the image is is hidden from our vision um it just felt especially appropriate to me <clears throat> to be making a work that emphasized my own inability to see the big picture during a global pandemic or you know when i felt like i imagine we all felt like this but i was just drowning in the unknown and I was struggling um, knowing that all I knew in my current experience um, were these small fragments of information, these fault, these, this very individualized experience for something that I knew was affecting the entire globe. Um, just to, it was really, really challenging to, to wrestle with that idea all the time. Um, you know, in my in a lot of my imagery lately, I've been utilizing methods of perspectival shifting. So um, I find that I'm often sort of attempting to balance two opposing sensations of peace and uneasiness, and it means thrusting together the familiar and the unfamiliar, um, and you know that ends up blending in, in the work itself. This is washing. Um, of course, you know there are just different ways to portray these metaphorical thresholds. So this is, a, you know, a hanging veil is one way. Um, taking these familiar spaces like a kitchen sink, this again, um, basin to, you know, where I feel like I am bringing a lot of my, I don't know, anguish at the end of the day, I end up in this, like at the kitchen at the sink, washing dishes or, you know, over, over the sink somehow it's, you know, taking and bending this very familiar space. Um, it's just, you know, there, there are wonderful ways to kind of adjust our, awareness of our homes um, and, and shifting perspective is, is one way to do that. Um, there's a way I think I do that really successfully and that's in this painting, which is dual consecration. And um, it's suggesting two perspectives at once, right? This idea of trying to hold two things that can't possibly exist in the same space, um, but do, right, somehow. Um, you're looking down at your plate and you're also looking forward at the table seat across from you. Um, and it kind of exists between states of viewing and being. Um, so there's like a use and a non-use of paint that maybe questions the frame as both a window and a surface. Um, the way that this, you know, frame is even kind of constructed is hard to register. Um, and then the image itself kind of presents multiple variations of emptiness and cradling, right? These basins, right? Um, chairs, cups, bowls, um, even spoons, right? Are, are their own mini little cradles or basins. Um, and there are there are moments of you know, near mirroring or things that are just feel not quite right or aligned. Um, and the, in the position of, of one of the place settings, it puts the viewer in the piece looking down 
Um, and the placement of the second confuses the viewer about whom they are or, or are not dining with. Again, the placement is to the left, whereas the seat is to the, you know, straight ahead. It's it's mismatched. It's not quite quite right. But I think you know the setting suggests some sort of expected communion, some sort of expected expected shared meal. But the chair across the table is vacant, and and its vacancy is maybe the most dominant thing in the image, right? That it's um, vacancy casts a shadow against this backlight that's illuminated, making it the most present absence in the entire image, even though there's all these empty plates and empty cups, um, that the most present absence is the individual or the um, communal partner. Um, and it's unsettling, I think, but the, the painting is meant to be sort of soft and gentle. It's to give you the space to wrestle with this really confusing experience um, without feeling harsh, without feeling impossible. It's meant to be and make it easy for you to deal with this sort of unsettling and confusing situation. Um, just to, to begin to maybe wrap up, I, I want to make work that allows viewers to behold and to be held. Um, I listened to a, a really wonderful artist talk of, um, with Anne Hamilton um, in, at, when I saw her speak at Western Carolina University, and I think it was 2018, um, where she said, uh, she was talking about her, um, her work at the Tate. Um, she was talking about the swing piece that she made and um, how important she said it, it is to let viewers feel supported because when something, she said this, when something takes your weight, you fall open. And it's just so true, right? That we can't really open up until we feel grounded. Um, but how do we do that in a world that doesn't, you know, seem to give us any grounding? Um, and so if, you know, if my work does anything at all, I'd like it to sort of enact this space to um, enact this very quiet resistance against, you know, late capitalism, like against what Arden Reed is calling speed culture, um, those compelling sensations that drive and propel us to overwork, to neglect ourselves, to fail to care care properly for ourselves and for one another, um, and to offer this protected, proper resting place for other people to fall open. Um, you know, and, and maybe this comes out of sort of an ex existential desire I have for, um, you know, to, to serve the world in a way that I don't personally feel like I can even do very well, um, and, and maybe hope that my work can, which is to breathe out peace into chaotic times. Um, you know, in palette, in composition, in um, maybe really an enticing smoothness of these works. Um, I, I make painting in hopes that it will invite the sensation of reprieve, um, that it will be a refuge, that it will exist as a sanctuary space without expectation um, so that it can enact that peace that it's meant to breathe out. Um, and I know it is dramatic, it's ambitious, it's um, grandiose and, and kind of ridiculous. Um, but, you know, ultimately I really, hope that my work, if not now, maybe someday can still provide this tender sacred space um, that makes it just a, you know, a little bit easier to uncover all these fragments of light that exist um, hidden somewhere throughout the world. So maybe I'll, I'll stop there. I know I've, I've been talking for a while. I thought maybe it would be a good time to open it up for, for questions. Um, maybe I can go back here. That was awesome. Thank you so much. Well, thank you for inviting me to share. Yeah, of course. Um, I want to start off with a question. Um, um, I guess I like looking at your work and reading about your work. Um, I wanted to ask, um, how do you think like late stage capitalism has changed the way we interact and look with look at domestic spaces? Um, yeah. Gosh, what a good question. Um, I don't know. I I think we we look at it more as something that can be commodified, maybe than we used to. Um, it's really strange to like. I I am someone who looks at Instagram as um, you know a, a like really great connecting ground for art artwork and artists. It's like like. LinkedIn for artists or Facebook for artists. I feel like Instagram becomes this great thing, but I know it's like really strange to be bombarded on Instagram with ads that literally show you like pictures of people's home spaces. 
um, and how we are making the public, like the private, we are making what was formerly private incredibly public. Um, and that there's a, a really great book called Late Capitalism, um, 24 seven um, working or something and, and the ends of sleep. Um, and it's, oh gosh, written by a guy named Thomas something with a C. Um, I wish I remembered the name, but he, Thomas Kura something, maybe I'll remember later. But in this book, he wrote about um, how that we, like the existence of a public and a private space, a private, private space doesn't even exist anymore. That um, all of our private moments, our private experiences become sort of publicized because of how much we've invited, um, you know, our workday and our um, understanding of identity in a in a late capitalism structure and a in a society that's kind of driven and um, perpetuated with um, notions of commodity, notions of branding, that we've turned these private moments of our lives into something that we. Um, you know, publicize and commodify um, that it's, it's, we just have eliminated the even idea of a private space for ourselves that it, the only things that exist now are, are the public and the secret. Um, and how, I don't know, that just makes me so sad. <laughs> um, and so I think, I still think of domestic space as being a, a sort of private space. Um, I, I think about like bedrooms, especially, we don't see, we aren't invited into people's bedrooms often publicly. I, I hope, you know, I mean, <laughs> obviously like you know there's sex tapes and there's all sorts of crazy things that exist but I think it's a really beautiful idea that there are still spaces and components of our lives that remain private for ourselves private with other people um, and I think I still look at domestic space as something that really needs protection because of that um, I don't know that's a big question that's a really tough question yeah it is and like the way Prairie um, is the, name of the writer C R A R Y Thomas Crary, I I think. I'm gonna write that down. Yeah it's, yeah, it's a really interesting book, but I I it's just so, it's like he is just predicting all these like this 24/7 and work lifestyle that's you know there's no end to our day that it's constant and how that's just not normal for us as human beings. It's not meant. Yeah. To, what we're meant to do. <laughs> yeah, something that I also think about with that is how I mean I feel personally this is kind of sad, but I feel like um, the domestic space has become more of a, I guess, I don't know if transitory is the right word, like a space that I'm passing through instead of actually resting in. Wow. That's really, did you feel that way through the pandemic? Or like that's a, like during lockdown, I've been thinking a lot about how our understanding of home has changed because a lot of people were suddenly working at home. And so your home is not a separate space from work. And therefore, what does it become? Did you feel um, during differently? During the pandemic, yes, I felt differently during the pandemic because I was very much home. Um, but um, in like, I guess like outside of the pandemic, now that we're we're not back to normal, but we're back to work and things like that, um, um, uh, I kind of feel like even before the pandemic that this, like my home is not like this, I guess the space for me to like sit down and rest, it's just a space for me to pass through until the next day. Oh, wow. Yeah. And it's like funny how we need to even retrain ourselves to think that or that even do we recognize when we feel that way? I, I feel that way personally. I mean, really, I, it's strange. I think a lot about, um, you know, as somebody who's just moved like every two or three years when I was in school and when I was in graduate school and then I was teaching, it's like, I've just been moving all the time. Um, and I, I think um, a lot about my grandparents' home, um, which I, has inspired a lot of my work. Also, a lot of the imagery comes from from, you know, images of my grandparents' home. Um, I think a lot about my grandparents' bed. Um, actually, it's this like place of again simultaneous coming and going. It's where my 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 own mother was theoretically conceived. It's where my grandmother died. It's like this immense circle of life. And it's also this private space that I'll never really know. You know, it's it's someone else's bed and, and place of rest that I can never really, there's like a block to really enter that and know it from the inside out. Um, but my grandparents still, have, my grandfather still lives in this home. They've had it for over 60 years. And it has been right that it has remained the same throughout my entire life, which is crazy to think about. Um, 
yeah, it's almost 70 years they've had this poem, but I, it's, is that right? I think so. Um, but it's, it's crazy to think about that, that I can't think of my own home in the way that I think of their home because their home feels like this institution. It feels like something that is rooted and planted and, and, you know, obviously has not changed that there is record of former life in that home. There's, I can go through the attic and find old calendars and, um, school projects that my, my mother did as a kid or, or, you know, my uncles made, um, there, there's just record of time in that home. Um, whereas, you know, in the places that I've been living for the last several years, each time I keep moving, um, I don't have that same record. I don't have that same sensation of rootedness or plantedness. And, um, I'm wondering, you know, how do you build that? How do you build that? Right. That's not something that is only inherent to time. There are ways in which we can conduct our rituals or our homes, you know, our mentality to change that. Um, there's a great book by Jennifer Johung, which is called, um, emotions of home or something, the prim primordial hut of home or something. Um, it's a little bit like lofty, but there are these great moments in this book where she talks about um, how we conceive of the idea of home because we live in such a transitory time. People um, in the last hundred years are, are moving more frequently than, you know, we have in the last hundred, maybe 200 years, we're just moving so much more constantly that we don't stay in the same place our families have lived for many years. We don't um, remain in the same neighborhoods or homes this, at the same rates. Um, and, you know, as that change, I, I imagine that's not going to slow down anytime soon. I think people will remain transitory. So how do we mentally kind of give ourselves that idea when we come home to our spaces that, that it is a place we can fall open, that it is a place that we feel rested and we can feel planted? How do we, how do, we do that? That's a mental, a mental thing, I think, in a lot of ways. Hard. Mm. Thank you so much for answering that. Yeah, it's such a also just a really a really great thing to think about. I'm yeah. thinking about it all the time, all the time, obviously. Yeah. Um, just like to the audience, if you have any questions, feel free to unmute or to put your questions in the chat box, and I can read them to Catherine, whichever you prefer. Um, another question I had that you touched up on a little bit when you answered my previous question is um, in your work, do you ever think about the, I guess like the cons, like how constant the idea of home is no matter what, even though I know, like you mentioned the refugee crisis, like the idea of home is like precarious to some people, it can even be a source of trauma to some people. Um, but um, it's still like a constant thing in like our lives that we have to think of. Yeah, it is. And I, I wrestle with that myself all the time. And I, I think it's like, if I had good answers for these questions, or if I had maybe like more concrete solutions to kind of creating these spaces for myself or for others, I, I wouldn't be painting about them. Um, you know, I think it's like, I, yeah. I feel like I'm making these paintings out of, again, it, it's, out of a sort of desperation, out of an anxiety and a want for this space. Um, and I, yeah, I just, I, I still feel that like looking at art is something that places me um, more, more singularly that I think anything that helps me practice, anything that helps me practice ritualized consistent motions um, anything that helps me focus more singularly is are things that help train me to get better at making home space. Um, and so that's why maybe I connect that with making paintings, which require a lot of stillness and a lot of ritual. Um, at least in my practice, it does, you know, um, that making, making paintings like this is a sort of training ground for when I come home as a reminder of these sort of like domestic actions that will um, almost like teach my body how to, how to, like, I, if I get my body to do these things that they will then train my brain and like the psych, the psychology in me to, um, to, to do, to follow. Um, I'm also like, I'm, I'm notoriously terrible at this stuff. Like, I wish I was someone who was better at domestic routine. Um, you can ask anyone who's lived with me. I am, I am terrible at these. I'm not good at regularly, like cooking good meals for myself or going to bed when I should go to bed. Um, 
I, 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 you know, talked to a lot of friends and people in my life who've, who've offered me great advice. And one of the things a lot of them say is like, just create these regular things for yourselves. Like do things like sleep hygiene, right? Like where you do the same activities before you go to sleep. Um, because like sleeping is hard for me. I struggle a lot with insomnia. Um, and I think those, that idea is tied very closely with my, um, my fear of like home's fragility, you know? Um, and I don't even feel like I have a, a strong reason or, you know, to, to feel that way. I maybe in, you know, just traditional, like moving frequently, but I don't come from a space that was torn apart. I don't come from a town that um, was bombed. I don't come from, I cannot imagine for people who have been forced to vacate their homelands or to traverse their, um, you know, traverse from, from, you know, where they've grown up and spent their lives building community and these routines and these spaces, um, what it must be like to, to experience that level of um, shift, like mental shift when it comes to the idea of home. Um, so I don't know, I even I on a small scale, I feel it like so minutely comparatively, and I, I still struggle. I, I wish I had like firm answers to how to how to work through that. And I, I don't, I think that's, it's like, that's why I feel like I have to paint to train myself to learn. Yeah. It feels like an act of um, uncovering and learning. Painting has, feels like a way of answering questions that I don't even know how to ask. Yeah. And like, like you said, that's why you're making work. Like um, if you had all the solutions, like, you know. Um, <laughs> <I think it's, laughs> we make work at all right it's like i i think we're always trying to like make the worlds we want to see or we're trying to answer questions we feel are really impossible um all the artist friends i've known and maybe you can attest to this i feel so strongly that a lot of the artists i know um at on some level and maybe it's like some deeper subconscious level are always trying to like fight the worst parts of themselves or they're trying to build these worlds that they can't enact um in their own reality that there's we're always trying to counter or answer these like you know more singular questions that seem to drive big parts of our lives um they're all like all artists i know are really concerned about a small number of things and they just keep like trying to answer those questions over and over and over um i don't know any active artist who isn't who isn't at, at some way trying to like answer a question they can't they can't work out yeah a lifetime job, I guess, keeps me busy forever. Absolutely. I don't know. And, um, something else. Uh, um, your work has me thinking of just like, again, thinking about interior spaces, home, the domestic. Um, like when I, and this is maybe like, kind of bad but when I think about domestic spaces I gender it because that's how I've been programmed um essentially and when I think about like now as an adult when I think about like domestic spaces I also think about like um labor and um and uh how um the domestic and like women there was a period of time where women were uh, like when, where women did not work, which like is very untrue. And like, that was just unpaid labor because um, if like people don't see it as labor because it was done in the house or in the home. Um, do you ever like uh, think about that in your work? Maybe that's just me just like reading so deeply into it, but. Um, I don't think you're making like a like crazy connection. I think that's like a really valid place to go from here. I, I will not lie. It's something I worry about because whenever you're making work about the domestic as a woman or as a like, um, female presenting individual, um, it's, I, I get nervous. I get worried. I think, oh, is this automatically going to be made about, um, is this going to be turned into something about, um, you know, female inequality and, and, um, you know, domestic labor and, and that I, I was afraid of that as a like young emerging artist, um, which is terrible, right? Like it's, uh, you know, I, I, I was like, oh, I can't be a woman making work about like women problems. Like I, you know, that's like a really horrible thing to be frightened of or to be concerned about, but it's the truth, right? Because that um, you wonder, you know, will that be taken as seriously or will that be recognized as, um, as valid um concerns or or you know 
as as complex or as um, important on a philosophical or aesthetic level. Um, it's something I was definitely concerned of about as a student, um, especially as a master student. Um, but you're not wrong to make those connections. I haven't mined them super thoroughly beyond that, um, but beyond like the fear of how it would be viewed by, by like you know the, the art world. Um, so it's not something I've I've mined a ton on my own. But but I don't think again like we're talking about domestic labor being work. There's a reason I struggle to do it. There's a reason a lot of us struggle to do it well or to um, value it appropriately. I mean, gosh, we know that like domestic work and um, especially childcare, which is which is also kind of grouped in a lot of times with domestic work has become such a critical and essential um, need for our country. Um, and that's being maybe made most more obvious than it has in uh, maybe ever, I don't know. Um, that I, so I, I wonder too, if, if those, I don't know, those cultural and current trends are making their way into my subconscious. Um, but, you know, consciously, I haven't, I haven't mined that very, very thoroughly. So I don't know, maybe, and it may be something that um, I'm going to be driven to, to focus more on in the future. Um, a year from now, I'm going to be mining whatever I was subconsciously working through now, right? And so, which is always the way it works. And so I, I imagine it will come up eventually. <laughs> And we're getting close to time. So I think we have room for one more question. I just wanted to see if anyone in the audience wanted to ask a question. Um, if not, I would be so happy to ask the last question because I'm having a great time. <laughs> um, but yeah, if you have a question, feel free to unmute or put it in the chat box. Um, okay, it looks like I'm asking the last question. Um, um, I, oh, I have a question. Wait, yay. Yeah. Um, I think there's nothing wrong painting something personal. In fact, one of it was Dean, the last name is Dean. I don't remember the first name, but he had an exhibit, I believe at the Nelson Art Gallery. And some of the uh, critics would say, well, your paintings are too personal. I said, well, that very personal painting, um, a very nice benefactor bought his painting. So he explained that he painted with his heart, not what the, um, not what was popular. Mm. And so, and he's a fairly well-established artist. I, the only thing I can say is, the last name is Dean, and he is from Florida. Oh. Jonathan Nelson. I don't know. Um, do either of you know? Maybe Marissa or Isabel, do you guys know? Who that I'm unfamiliar with that work. Um, but um, yeah, I, I'm unfamiliar with the last name Dean um, at the Nelson, just because so much work passes through the Nelson um, as an encyclopedic institution. But yeah, I mean, um, well, at, at any rate, he had an interview on YouTube. So See if we can find it, I, um, yeah, it's, I, I, it's hard to find the right balance of um, like the personal and the communal or the personal and the um, sort of commu like objective experience like that. Um, the, I think the ideal art exists in the perfect sort of Venn diagram right on the the exact middle section where the personal meets the um the sort of at large public communal experience the human experience mm -hmm. that um that there is a there is a perfect balance that can exist it's just hard to find um and and yeah I think we shouldn't shame artists for making personal work I think I, I don't know I think a lot about Tracy Emin who also, when you think about domestic spaces, when you think about um, maybe like women who are oversharing, right? Like, <laughs> um, I just think it's like, look at how strong and how powerful that work is. And um, yeah, it's hard not to, it's hard when you're a young artist, I think when you're an emerging artist, not to be compelled by trends too, when you're trying to survive or get noticed or um, 
to exhibit. It's easy to be um, distracted by what is trendy. Um, and, and yeah, finding the right balance is, can be tough, can be tricky. But it's, yeah, it's worth supporting, supporting artists when they're, when they're being honest about what they're interested in and what's important and, they, and the questions they're trying to answer. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much, my friend. Thank and you. So it was, so yes, we're on, we're just right on time. It's 730. Thank you again for sharing yourself and your work with us. I really appreciate it. Thank you to all of you for coming. For those of you in Kansas City, Catherine's exhibition, Unfixing, will be up at KCAC until October 29th. So if you are in Kansas City, come in. We're here at KCAC from um, Wednesday through Saturday at 11 a.m. to 5 p.m. Thank you so much for being here all. Bye. Thank you so much as well. Thank you, Marissa. Thanks Thank for having you. me. Have a great night. Bye.